Okay guys, so now for a short while I want to talk a little bit more about the legalities of the medicines that we administer and when we know where to look for the legal directions in terms of given drugs, so whether that's the JR Calc guidelines, whether it's PGDs, we can start to glean a little bit more information about indications and dose and then we can link that to the mechanism of actions that we've talked about earlier. So I'm going to term this applied pharmacology because this is the application of our medicines guidelines to our practice. Now before we even start with that this is something again you guys are intimately familiar with as technicians so we have this distinction between over-the-counter and prescription drugs. Prescription drugs are usually classified by their active ingredient or how they treat a particular condition but we want you to start paying attention to generic names rather than trade names because this is at this level of practice, especially when you're going to start using paramedic drugs, we need to stop thinking about trade names and start thinking about what the active ingredient of a drug is. So for example, I've got a couple of pictures here. Clopromazine is labeled a uh, lar Largactyl in some areas uh, or Thorazine is another version of Clopromazine. These are the same drugs but they have different trade names because they're made by different companies. So both the same drug and we want to just pay attention to the generic name as best as we can. Things like Narcan, Narcan is a trade name, Naloxone is the generic name. So it's just important to make that distinction. Again, it'll be obvious on packets. This applies to over-the-counter medications a lot more than prescription drugs. But again, lots of prescription drugs also have brand names and patients will likely know their medications by their brand name rather than by their generic. So over-the-counter drugs we encounter all the time in our daily practice. Many of the medications that we carry are over-the-counter. This is paracetamol, glucogel, aspirin, loads of other ones. Now whether a drug is over-the-counter or prescription doesn't really matter to us massively. Uh, because we can't just give out over-the-counter drugs either, but actually that we're talking about the, the way that the patient can obtain drugs. So over-the-counter refers to drugs that patients can buy freely themselves in the pharmacy or in the shop. Prescriptions only must be prescribed by an authorised person, like a GP or a nurse practitioner, a doctor in the hospital, and now paramedics have prescribing rights if you've done the appropriate course and you have your annotation on the register. So paramedic prescribers and our independent paramedic practitioners are becoming more numerous year on year. So you are gonna encounter more paramedics that can prescribe. But what we do when we give a drug is technically prescribing in itself. So we're prescribing, administering, and supplying the drug all in one transaction. It's important to remember that prescribing Traditionally, you think of prescribing, I think, as the GP writing you a note and sending you to the pharmacy. But technically, any drug administration is a part of prescribing as well. Now, the other category of drugs that we get involved in is controlled drugs. And these are covered by the Misuse of Drugs Act 1971. And then the Misuse of Drugs Regulations 2001 kind of altered a couple of bits. These are lists of drugs that are controlled in law and can only be given by authorized individuals. And of course, we have access to some of these controlled drugs. In paramedic practice, we're talking about morphine, diazepam, midazolam. The Act regulates everything to do with these drugs, the way that they're manufactured, they're supplied, they're administered, and they're prescribed. So as healthcare professionals who are involved in the supply and administration of these drugs directly, we need to be familiar with these bits of legislation. Now, they're large bits of legislation. They are distilled in the HCPC guidance, and I'll link to the HCPC guidance in a moment. So go there first. If you want to read the Acts in full, it's not a bad idea. It's good to be familiar with the laws that underpin our practice. So the main distinction then for us when it, we talk about giving drugs is this GR Calc versus PGD or exemption versus PGD principle. Now most medicines given by pre-hospital practitioners in the UK come under these categories. So we have exemption medicines and these are given because of the Human Medicines Act 2012. Now I'm actually going to show you the Human Medicines Act 2012, or I'm going to show you the, so you should be able to see this on the screen here. So 
This is the an overview of the Human Medicines Act 2012, and it talks about the exceptions to rules on selling, supplying, or administering medicines for some groups of healthcare professionals. Now, it actually goes through all of the individual types of healthcare professionals and what drugs they can give independently under their own under their own drive. So, if we go down to paramedics, this quite specifically says, and this is the wording in the policy as well that paramedics can administer certain treatments on their own initiative to sick or injured persons who need immediate treatment and these are the drugs listed here now as a registered paramedic you can keep stocks of these and you can minister p medicines pharmacy medicines as part of your practice now we don't need to worry about that because obviously the ambulance service provides our medicines for us but this is pretty much where gr calc draws its medicines list from but you'll notice that certain things are not included in this list. So control drugs like morphine are in here, naloxone, ondansetron, sodium chloride, centimetron, tenecteplase, amiodarone. These are all included in here. But there are some drugs that we can use in the Scottish Ambulance Service that don't fall into this. So where are we going to find those? Well, these are given to us via PGD, which is Patient Group Direction. Now, this is a specific document that's signed and authorised by the medical director. And the medical director essentially devolves his responsibility to all of the Scottish Ambulance Service paramedics in order to allow us to give a drug for a specific purpose. Now, the difference here, the legal difference, is that exemption medicines are governed under the Human Medicines Act 2012, but it isn't prescriptive as to when the medicines are used or in what dose. So we need to look at the GR Calc guidelines to guide us on how to use the medicines. If we use the medicines in other ways than are specified in GR Calc, then obviously we would need to defend that in court if required, and we'd need to have a good justification for using them out with our guidelines. But that is an option for registered paramedics. Again, with everything, if you can justify your actions, then as long as you can justify and your patient is safe, then that's going to be a, a fair course of action. With patient group directions, this doesn't apply. You need to give a drug exactly as it is specified in the patient group direction. Otherwise, you have no legal authority to give that drug because it is a form of prescription, supply, and administration. So that's the difference. Now, I have linked the patient group directions on Blackboard for you to have a look at. And you'll notice that the, the wording is very legal and it's very much specific for different presentations. So, for example, the TXA PGD is very specific as to which patients we can treat and why. Now, pay attention to this wording when we're thinking about what drugs we're going to give and how we're going to give them. And make sure that you know which drugs are included in the exemptions versus the PGDs. Now, you'll find in the folder provided for you on Blackboard, the PGDs, the most up-to-date versions of the PGDs. And if you open them, they will come up in PDF format. Now, again, like I said, noting the specific wording, this says that healthcare professionals must be authorised by name under these PGDs before attempting to treat a patient according to it. And this is why we need to sign our PGDs. And you'll do this when you register as a paramedic at the end of your year. Before using the PGD, you must ensure that you're working within your scope and you are competent in how to treat patients. Again, this is very legally worded for a specific reason. Now, they're signed off by members of the manage uh, medicines management group or by the medical director, and this is all steadfastly documented. So you can see the medical director's signature here. Again, we're talking about registered healthcare professionals, particularly this is the TXA PGD. So you can see that any registered healthcare professional who has signed this PGD can administer the drug. So we're not just talking about paramedics. If we have nurses working within the organization or other healthcare professionals, they can sign this PGD and use this drug for these purposes as well. Now, it'll specifically say criteria for inclusion, which it does here. So for TXA, for example, this is used in patients who have sustained trauma who fulfills any of the criteria. And we're talking about signs of external hemorrhage where advanced hemorrhage control has been used, pregnant women who have been, been, been involved in traumatic injury or patients in traumatic cardiac arrest. There is then a lot of breakdown of what patients fall into the inclusion criteria and what patients must be excluded. Now, I'm going to leave you guys to read this yourselves, but I think it's quite obvious 
that the guidelines are very specific compared to GRCalc, which just gives you general guidelines as to when drugs could be used. So I'll let you guys have a look at that in your own time.